chilling tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is intended for mature audiences and may contain strong language, adult themes, and content of a violent and sexual nature which may not be appropriate for everyone. Welcome, listener, to the horror hell. If it's the darkness you seek, you won't be disappointed. I'm your host, Jason Hill, and it's time for our appointment. In this place, there is no sun, and nightmares do come true. Here, instead of shadow falling, the shadows follow you. Consider getting comfortable before the air grows colder. Prepare yourself, if you dare. Come, inch a little closer. If darkness is what you're after, seek no more your searches through. You haven't found the darkness, traveler. The darkness <laughs> has found you. <laughs> Good evening. You're listening to Horror Hill. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 2. I'm your host, Jason Hill, and I'm thrilled you could join me tonight. In today's episode, courtesy of authors G.V. Anderson and Stephen Miller, come two bone-chilling tales about unexpected afterlifes and holographic hells. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and all our other episodes, as well as hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today to get instant access from our friends at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Thank you for your support. Now, without further ado, allow me to escort you to a place where the sun dies and nightmares come to life, where those who seek the darkness need look no further. Welcome, listener, to the Horror Hill. You haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. Our first tale of terror this evening comes to us courtesy of author G.V. Anderson. In it, we'll meet a gentleman who has quite literally reached the end of his rope, having lost his life to the hangman's noose, only to find himself in an afterlife, unlike anything he could have imagined. That, however, turns out to be the least of his concerns as his first thoughts settle not on his own plight, but on that of his brother, who preceded him in death two days earlier. When he learns of his brother's fate and whereabouts, he sets out to make things right in a world where everything is wrong. Without further ado, I present to you Crook's Landing by Scaffold. My brother was hanged on a Monday, and two days later I followed him. When the trap door opened for the short drop, the sharp stop never came. Instead, my soul slithered loose from my body and I fell into darkness, landing with a crash atop a mountain of junk. Odd battered shoes, gimmicked dice, prosthetic noses, the cheat's cast-offs, the swindler's knickknacks, 
It all reeked of piss. I pulled the sackcloth off my head. A square moon in a black sky shed some light, but not much. It were actually the light from the trap door, a whole world away. I'd have seen the two black soles of my feet dangling there if I'd had the wits to look. Hello, came a muffled cry from behind me. I tried to stand, but the junk pile shifted under my weight. A set of cupping balls went skittering down the slope. I settled for rolling onto my belly and stared dumbly at the figure making their wobbly way towards me. They wore grayish prison clothes, too, though theirs were slashed and daubed with handprints in white and red. They'd cut eye holes into their sackcloth and stitched a smirk into the stiff weave. They raised an arm in greeting. We saw you fall. Where... Where am I? Crook's Landing, they beamed. I could hear the smile in their voice, gesturing at the view from the mountaintop. You're dead. I followed their hand. A city grew out from the base of the mountain, buildings dipping and then rising again in the middle distance, their shingle roofs overlapping like scales in the dim light. A stiff breeze dragged the stench of the canal behind it, bringing sluggish brown water to mind. And, if I squinted hard, I could make out the millions of scurrying bodies in the streets and back alleys, like a plague of ants. So, this was Crook's Landing. Journey's end for the street grifter, the slick confidence man, and everyone in between. I'd heard about it all my life. How could I not? Growing up above the corner pub. When my brother and I stood at our dad's graveside, his mates clapped our shoulders with tattooed, signet-ringed hands and said, I'll be in Crooks London now, lads. <laughs> it was an afterlife. A prize. A club. But it weren't real. No more real than heaven. I turned back to the figure on the mountaintop. They pulled off their sackcloth masks to give me a chipper wink. Underneath was a boy, hardly older than my brother, who probably got caught up in his local pickpocketing racket. I'd seen kids like him before. He pulled me unsteadily to my feet. Oh, it's a bit of a shock, right? Bit of a shock to be in the afterlife I always took for bunk, and I threw a right fit over it. I can tell you, I thought the moment before death must have sent me around the twist. But it's much easier to say I simply nodded, shook his hand, and said, Yep. I'm nosy, he said. I'm with the breakneck boys, I am. Saw your fall, we did. Just thought we'd come over and say hello. Better than letting them thrashers get you first. You do look like a breakneck, I reckon. By then, the rest of the gang that called themselves the Breakneck Boys had joined us on the mountaintop. They wore prison clothes too, slashed like nosies, and had decorated their sackcloth masks with sneers and smiles. This mountain was their patch, they told me, and they saw all the newcomers by scaffold fall out of the sky. They made it their mission to welcome them, recruit them if possible, and at all costs keep them out of the reach of their rival gang. The Thrashers, who lived on the next mountain over. Um, did you see someone fall two days ago? I asked. The question came so easy, I didn't stop to wonder that I could remember to ask it. My little brother, Charlie. Oh, he'll be scared shitless by all this. Nosy scratched his head in amazement. The days up there don't mean much to us down here. I have not new boy in a while anyways. Can't speak for that lot over there, though. By that lot, he meant the Thrashers. Their mountain was smaller, darker, really more of a dune. The gang members gathered along its spine like crows watching us. They'd all seen me fall, too. Perhaps they'd seen Charlie. I told Nosy and the boys that I had to ask them, and Nosy agreed to show me the way. Will you join the breaknecks when you get back? Said one of the boys and I had to shake my head. If Charlie hadn't joined the Thrashers, then he must have gone down into the city, and as the older brother, I'd always sworn to look out for him. Oh, said the boy, crestfallen. Then they perked up. Can we have your togs? 
Some of us needs new ones. Got a bit carried away, we did. So, with me dressed in whatever scraps I could get from the mountaintops, we headed over to the Thrashers, skidding down the junk slopes and slashing our forearms on the edges of game card decks. You must really love your little brother, Nosey said, pinching together the bloodless but no less gruesomely parted flesh near his elbow. Yeah, I said, winded, as we climbed the next peak. I really do. And I grasped then for a memory of him. Something to make Nosy laugh, and found it was hard. Like sinking my hands into tar. A month after my dad had died, I couldn't remember the sound of his voice, or the color of his eyes. And I reckon it must work the same way when you're the one who's dead too. Already I couldn't even remember my mom. And her face had been the last thing I'd seen, before they put the sackcloth over my head. I clapped my hands around my skull like I was trying to stop it breaking apart. Nosey flinched. Oh, sorry. It's just, you must really love him, because most people clean forget as soon as they come here. You all right? Layer by layer, by texture, by smell, by sound, I dredged up an image of Charlie, a boy of 13 with a buzz cut, hard eyes, and a loud mouth, dirty fingernails, surprisingly delicate tendons at the nape of his neck, the soft hollow between them. I hadn't seen him hanged, didn't like to picture the rope chafing him there, but the toughness fell away, and he looked like a little bird. It had been me who talked him into working that last scam, and all the others before it. Mom lost the pub when Dad died. She lost one home, and we were going to lose another. She didn't tell me as much, but I'd seen it in the single slice of bread and jam she gave Charlie for supper while we went without. Dad's mates were still hanging around, and I was a tough kid who looked older than I was. Didn't take much to fall in with him, work some short cons. Mom didn't like me doing it, but pretty soon she relied on that money. Relied on my building it back up from scratch. Rent day after rent day. Charlie started skipping school to help me out, because it was just like Dad always said. Real work, not passing some poncy exam, was what put food on the table. So, it was my fault Charlie had been with me when our sting stung the wrong mark at the poker pits. It was my fault they prosecuted us. The only sons of the late, great Mackenzie Foster, with the full force of the law... It was my fault they slipped a noose around his bird-like neck. And it was my fault that Mom was alone. The Thrashers said the same as the Breakneck Boys. That is, time passed differently in Crook's Landing and two days was impossible to peg. But they grudgingly brought their newest recruit forward for inspection. I don't know what I feared more. Not finding him. Or finding a boy who wouldn't remember me but none of them were Charlie. So I shook the gang leader's hand and turned cityward. Nosey spat at their feet and hurried after me. Where would he have gone? I asked him as we drew closer to the murky lights. The mountain slide slowly turned to scree. I don't know, he said. Newcomers just slip in where there's space. They might have ended up in the fighting ranks, I suppose. At the startled look on my face, he added, Not to fight, I mean. That's where all the big business happens. Oh, Kenzie Foster holds court there. I bet he does, I said grimly. My old man had come to Crook's Landing and set himself up with a racket then, eh? <laughs> old habits, I guess. I didn't like the idea of meeting him again, but it was the most likely place to find Charlie. The dolt idolized our dad almost as much as he did me. Where are these ranks? Well, you want to head towards the spy there? The one with a crow? No, not to unscare in the man. Blimey, oh! That's an unlucky place to fall. And keep down mountains at five o'clock. You'll find it. You can't miss it. Right. Thanks. Nosey nodded and towed the scree like he had something else to say. But when I asked if he wanted to come along, he said, Nah, cost to my patch, you know. I'll see you around. I guess. As I crossed the bridge that spanned the canal, I glanced back at him. Dwarfed by the mountain of junk, he looked tiny and lost, 
like a boat snipped loose of its moorings. He probably never missed his memories, never spared a thought for them or the aimlessness of life in Crook's Landing, until I came along. Even on that bridge, con men went through the motions of find the lady, beckoning me to come and place your bets, while over the railing beggars feigned twisted limbs for coppers, just as they must have done when they were alive. With most of their minds scored away, it was all they knew to do. But there weren't no gullies to perform for down here. There was only the rest of us, and we knew all the tricks. Nosey jammed his sackcloth over his head and went back to his boys. I pressed on towards the spire, cradling my memory of Charlie close, like a cut purse cradles his loot. It was the only thing keeping me... Well, keeping me, me. The streets clogged up closer I got to the fighting rinks. Nosey was right to say you couldn't miss him. I was carried along like blood in a vein as the citizens of Crook's Landing surged towards the city's heart to do business, pay levies to my old man probably, or settle rows, and be pumped back out again afterwards, refreshed and ready for trouble. The alleys and side doors around our pub had worked the same way. Pinned between a one-eyed hag and a tall, dark-skinned hawker. I had no chance of finding Charlie in the crowd, but Hawker soon noticed my restlessness and stood on tiptoe to scan for my brother's buzz cut. I described for her the twin tendons of his neck, like a swallow's tail. I can't see him. Sorry. She shrugged, and then she said enviously, Oh, you must be fresh to remember something like that. I don't remember nothing. This old lady could be my gran, for all I know. The one-eyed hag huffed and turned her face away. I just came from the... The... I realized I didn't know what to call the mountain of junk looming over the city, but she caught on to my vague gesture. By scaffold, eh? She lowered her voice. How comes you ain't got your togs? The breakneck voice took him. The hawker nodded. Well, that's just as well if you're going to the rinks. Kenzie Foster and his lot don't like what come by scaffold. They says a good crook don't get caught. She offered me a slim hand to shake. Though by now we were crushed so close that the formality made us laugh. I'm Jack, she said. I went to say my name, but nothing came out. I just gripped her hand tighter. Ah, so you don't remember everything. Jag elbowed me the way I often elbowed Charlie. Well, that makes me feel better. While I tried not to panic about forgetting my name and the tiny part of myself that goes with it, wait, was I... Was I Bill? Barry? We turned with the crowd into the gawping entryway of what looked like an old meat market. The roof was made of ironwork that would have let in a fresh breeze and some pigeons if Crook's Landing had any. And stalls had been squeezed in along the walls, upper walkways, and across the floor, pedaling. What? Hmm. What do you peddle to people who don't eat or sleep or remember anything except how to wring money out of an unsuspecting mark? Some stalls sold clothes or wigs. Others upcycled the kind of junk I'd crash landed on. Others ran transparent scams like games at a fair or hawk dodgy ointments for things like baldness or athlete's foot. They weren't fooling anyone, especially Jag. I felt again the same hollowness I'd felt on the bridge, that we'd all come to Crook's Landing to blindly chase our own tails forever. This petty street stuff was below my dad anyway, so I sliced my way shoulder first through the throng of anonymous bodies toward the center where the noise was loudest. Jag followed me, muttering something about collecting a debt, but I reckon she simply didn't have anywhere else to go. Nosey said Charlie probably hadn't come to the rinks to fight. Most people didn't, but a fight was happening regardless. I could hear the meaty thunk of fist meeting face, or feet squelching in a slurry of ancient shit. A rowdy audience penned the fighters in a circle, shoving them together when they broke apart. Hands were everywhere waving coins and betting slips like little flags for the bookies to snatch up. I avoided an elbow to the face and climbed up the side of someone's stall, ignoring the sounds of protest from inside. From the striped canopy, I had a better view. 
The fighters were still fresh, though one had a swollen eye, and the other a limp I guessed must be fake. I watched the men trade blows despite myself, even whooped when my guess proved right, and the limping man shifted his weight to kick the other man in the balls. But the swollen-eyed man just laughed it off and pulled a leather guard out of his trousers. It was a game of trickery, a straight fight hardly passed for entertainment between crooks with nothing better to do. Me and Charlie weren't idle long enough to watch the boxing down in the warehouse district. I promised him I'd sneak us in one day when Dad weren't looking. I never did. He would have loved this. More spectators watched from the walkways above. The mood was quieter up there, like they had bigger fish to fry. I recognized my dad in the middle, but he didn't match the image I had for him in my head. He was smaller in person. Slimmer. Death had made him a giant to me. His long brown hair was all plates and wooden beads and his two gold front teeth gleamed. Just the same way they gleamed at the dark of our room when he came to kiss us goodnight. His breath had smelt of copper, of blood, of palms and dirty coins. Jag followed my gaze with a frown, then shot me a warning look as I hopped to the next stall in the spiral staircase nearby. Two lackeys blocked the way up, but I knew them. I need to see my dad, I said over the roar of the crowd. Who? They snorted when I told them. Old Kenzie ain't got no brats. Now clear off! My chest was tight. But he does! Charlie and... And me. He died when we were just kids, and you... I pointed to the one on the left. You died in the shootout with him, right? Your name was... You... Your name... But it wouldn't come. Their expressions turned odd. I looked at the right-hand one who flinched. You. You used to collect rents from my dad and drink pints of bitter in the pub afterwards. You. You used to... You used to peel all the designs off the back of our coasters, and my mom went mad because we got them printed specially. <laughs> Charlie liked picking the scabs off of your knuckles to see if you'd react. <laughs> oh, come on! There was no dawning recognition. No smile of acknowledgement. But it was like I'd smacked them with words, because they let me through in a daze, and took me to my dad. And he brushed me off too, until I told him about Charlie's thin flannel pajamas patterned with ducks, the silver studs he bought me when I turned eleven that stained my lobes green, and how the pub carpet always got gummed up with spilled beer and fag ash. I knew then that Charlie couldn't come to him, or he'd remember all this already. Wouldn't he? I trailed off. My dad was still looking at me like a stranger, but he gripped my shoulder and took me with him when he and his racket finally left the rinks. He'd made the harbor his stomping ground on the far side of Crook's Landing. The journey there felt as long as the walk from our flat to the square where I'd been hanged, and Mom had moved as far away from that life as she could afford. Distance made the mountain of junk look half its height, but space works strangely here. If I stood on the jetty out to sea, the farthest I could go from the mountain without wetting my heels and squinted really hard, the miles would fold in on themselves, and suddenly, Nosy and the boys would be right there, waving to me. My square moon, my entry point, still hung in the sky above them. Time hurt my head too, because how can you mark time when the light never changes, when there's no tide, no ticking clocks, no pulse? I explained to Dad that Charlie arrived two days before me, but the longer I spent here, the more I understood his confusion. Never mind Charlie. How long had I been here? A month? A moment? Crook's Landing, for all it seemed real could be a dream playing out in my head in the seconds it was taking my neck to break. How's your mum? My dad asked vaguely while eyeing a fake diamond. I don't think he remembered her really. He was just asking because he supposed, as his son, that I must have one, and he should ask. It's not like he remembered her when she was alive neither. 
he'd valued his name more. She's fine, I said. She lost her sons and her main source of income within a week, and before that, she'd been left a penniless widow. But yeah, sure, fine. He grunted. You both fall within my footsteps then. Yeah, I hadn't left us much choice. Charlie's smart though. Should have stayed in school, might even have won a scholarship. He and his cronies got a laugh out of that. You can't be too smart, neither of you. It's nothing you're so young. What happened? Jag had warned me about my dad's dislike of newcomers by scaffold. I sketched out that final sting in the poker pits for him. The one that got us caught. The look on the guy's face when he realized we duped him. The look on Charlie's face when we realized we had the wrong man. The back doors of the poker pits that opened inexplicably onto kitchens or cold, dry rooms full of hanging pig carcasses. We got lost. We had to fight a few bouncers off. I think Charlie hit one round the head with the chair. Then I made up some stuff about being tackled just as we got clear of the pits and getting shot later at a sleazy clubhouse and sat quietly while my dad listed everything we'd done wrong. We'd aimed too fucking high, he said. He flung the fake diamond across the room in disgust, hitting a lackey in the face. His temper hadn't changed then. I used to cover Charlie's ears at night when he really got going, when Charlie grew old enough to be scared. I was scared too, but unlike now, I had a little brother to distract me. You're shot though, eh? He cooled and leaned back to look out the window overlooking the harbor. Same moon as me, then. Same what? Same moon, you idiot! He jabbed a finger towards the sky. A bullet hole. Yeah, the moon's the way you come in, right? But he was a shade of a man he'd been. For all his raging. Pity replaced fear pretty quick once I'd hung around long enough to see him go dead-eyed like the rest of Crook's Landing. He only looked lively when someone said his name, but in a way like he didn't quite know why. I lingered on the edge of the world in case Charlie turned up, killing time by watching the dark boats pass by far out to sea, but he didn't. And the longer I waited, the longer this place worked on me, the less I cared. I still remember the details, the duck pajamas, the bread and jam, but they were becoming as random and disconnected for me as the bits of shell and seaweed scattered across the shore. Jag drifted into the harbor eventually. You didn't tell me Kenzie Foster's your dad. She sat with me at the end of the jetty. You ain't looking so fresh now. Did you not find him? Who? Oh. Her mouth thinned. Your brother Charlie. Got a neck like a swallow's tail. When I looked blank, she walloped me. Don't you be going feather-brained on me now, kid. I've been going round asking after him and all. Don't tell me. I've been wasting me time. Charlie. Charlie. <sighs> Charlie, yes! How could I have forgotten? Had he fallen in with some scruffy kids by the canal? Got picked up by a slumlord with wandering hands. Wherever he was. He was dead at 13. I was right. He should have stayed in school. My fault. I liked it. Us foster boys working together. Handling our combined spoils to mom at the close of each con felt like giving dad the finger. What if Charlie had stayed in school he'd be alive. Educated. Able to hold down a proper job. He'd have kept our mom much better than I ever did. Some brother I was. Some son. My square moon still hung over the mountain with my limp feet dangling halfway between that world and this one. I told Jag how they hanged him. They might have shared a noose. Jag listened, watching her own private sky. You know, asking about Charlie's giving me noggin a good prod or something. I remember someone tapping rocks to me ankles and tipping me in the river. I sank, and I sank, and I never hit bottom. Just fell out here. And she didn't sound sad, but happy. Happy to remember something about herself. She sniffed wetly, 
water slapped the stilts of the jetty. The harbor had always been silent. I leaned over and watched the water bob and curl against the wood where before it had been all as still as glass. What's that? Jack said, pointing out to sea. A boat was sliding towards us. One of the dark ones, from out where the water met sky. Its passenger was cowled, and something in my gut told me this weren't no human soul, but a native creature of Crook's Landing. The prow bumped against the jetty, and the creature turned to face us. Its gaze was cold. We have all heard you calling for your brother, we did, it said, tapping its chest. We are touched by your bond. I was still on my hands and knees. I gripped the end of the jetty. Silk stung my palms. Do you, do you know where he is? Is he all right? Jolly Forrester fell for. <sighs> Landed himself in Cutthroat Cove. I glanced up at Jag. She gulped. Cutthroat Cove is to murderers what Crook's Landing is to us. You ain't told me he killed no one. I scrambled up, fists clenched. He hasn't! The creature lifted a finger. He took a man's life before the end of his own. He's already told us how he struck him down. They died shortly after. The frantic escaped from the poker pits. The bouncers. I heard again the dull crack of the chair hitting the guy's head. A sound I'd taken for breaking wood. I'd actually been bone. I raked my nails down my face. But... But listen! He don't deserve to be lumped in with murderers! It was an accident! He's just a kid! Mom had let me feel her belly the first time he kicked. He was strong. With him, it wouldn't be just me and Mom against my dad anymore. I was only four. But I swore to look out for him, didn't I? Since then... Since then, I'd done anything but... So I thumped my chest. I'm responsible for that man's life. I'm the reason Charlie was there. I'm the one who should have known better. You have to... You have to let me take his place. You can't. Jack cried. We accept. Seriously? The creature inclined its head. Charlie Faust is young. Cutthroat Cove does not suit him. Yet, a life has been taken, and his place must be filled. Come with us now, so as that he can be restored to the living world. Living world? I frowned. How is that possible? He was hanged two days before I was. He died. Oh, did you hear the bones of his neck snap? The creature asked. Did you watch him cut his body down? I had to admit I hadn't. We'd been kept apart in prison and my cell had no windows. The sight and sound would have driven me mad otherwise. Small mercies. All times existed once in death, it said. And Charlie Foster's neck did not break. His breath has been stopped by a moment. Although that moment has been enough. We'll arrange for a last minute reprieve on accounts of his age. He will be cut down. And he will soon forget us. You can do that? The creature nodded. <laughs> How's else you think peoples would know to take the name of this place back with him? As I tried to breathe, well, I don't need to breathe. That's just a habit, I'm dead. Jag gripped my arm. I started remembering myself and it's you what done that. I don't want to forget again. None of us do. I held her hand. Over on the mountain, the thought of Charlie was spreading through Nosy and his boys like wildfire. In the darkest corner of the fighting ranks, my dad's cronies muttered about a boy who picked at the scabs on their knuckles. In his workshop, 
Mackenzie Foster recalled the day he hammered a nail through his oldest son's lobes to pierce them. On the bridge spanning the canal, a one-eyed hag whispered about a swallowtail neck. She would soon peer up at the sky, her head tilted to favor one side, and think. Swallows. Birds. Remember those? Crook's Landing was waking up. I don't think you'll have to worry about that ever again, I told Jag firmly, and something about my tone told her it was okay to let me go. I climbed into the boat. As we slid away from the shore, sinking deeper into death, I turned to the creature. How do I know you'll keep your word? Think about the last thing you saw. The last thing I saw. I am standing on the scaffold, looking down at my bare feet and the huge iron hinges of the trap door, trying not to be sick. My toenail is broken. The hangman moves behind me and my head jerks up. Is it happening? I'm not ready. I'll never be ready. The square is packed. There's my dad's mates. The ones who are keeping quiet right now so they don't hang too. There's my teacher. The man who bought the pub after we left. And the baker's wife who slips mom an extra loaf every once in a while. Before the too large sackcloth goes over my head, I see mom herself. And I hold her gaze until she starts to cry. She bows her head and kisses the crown of a buzz-cut boy. Her arms cross his chest, pulling him close. His neck is raw, same as his smile. You've been listening to Crook's Landing by Scaffold by author G.V. Anderson as performed by yours truly. Whoa, what a sweet ending that was, wasn't it? Much sweeter than the ending of a rope. But it makes you wonder just what our nameless hero has gotten himself into, surrounded by ruthless criminals of a far darker persuasion. And it begs the question, where will you and I find ourselves when we reach the end of our own ropes? <laughs> Up next, I've got another tale for you, my friends. This one from author Stephen Miller, as submitted directly to us here at Horror Hill. In it, we leave behind the fantastic otherworldly realms of the afterlife and explore a path on the opposite spectrum. Where might we end up, do you think, when instead of dying, we instead try to live forever? For our protagonist, a bug tester of an immersive virtual reality experience, his job is just that. But what happens when things in Wonderland get too real? Stay tuned and find out. From author Stephen Miller, I present to you, Beta Test. Roxy's Lounge. It was the sort of dimly lit, mid-century style bar that was too classy for me by half. In the real world, it's the kind of place I'd have gone to get shit-faced on overpriced cocktails at the game developers conference after party, but that was in the old days back when there was still a studio to foot the bill. Thankfully for me, here, inside the simulation, money was of no concern. But it wasn't just the promise of inebriation that led me through Roxy's neon entrance that night. It was a name. A name I'd stared at in the user list, incredulously, before walking my ass here from across town. Can't be him, I thought. When the hell did they jack him in? Oh, Jesus Christ. The words escaped beneath my breath. The cringe that followed could not be stifled. All I could do 
was avert my gaze to the ebony hardwood floor and let the involuntary expression run its course. When I unbuttoned my face, there he was, sitting at the bar. Mad cow. I waved away my holographic display. The translucent overlay of usernames, locations, notes shrunk and vanished into my peripheral vision. What remained was my old lead programmer, wearing a cow print suit and fedora. The infamous cow print suit and fedora, looking as ugly as it was expensive. He was hitting on the bartender. I felt aftershocks of cringe return. You son of a bitch! I said as I approached close enough to be heard over the murmur of other patrons. He spun around in the bar stool and sized me up behind a pair of ruby-tinted aviator glasses. He made an exaggerated frown. Tell me you don't look that old in real life, he said. Life comes at you fast. You, on the other hand. I gestured at his entire outfit, or apparently thirteen years old again. He scoffed and reached out to grab my hand. The handshake quickly became a pat on the back and then a full-blown hug. I hadn't seen Lucas, a.k.a. Matt Cow, in nearly ten years. Already, memories were flooding back of never-ending crunch nights at Dark Room Entertainment, our game studio. Memories of passing out at our desks, on couches, or occasionally the floor. It all seemed like a lifetime ago now. I took a seat next to him and signaled the bartender. What's the fun of living in a simulation, he said, if you don't peacock it up a bit. Have you even played with the closet options yet? You look like a confused pimp. Anyway, what's with this about living in a simulation? Buddy, I just work here, and when you got me this job, you didn't say I'd have to work with you. You think I'd pass on this sort of opportunity just because I... He stopped, but I could finish the thought for him. Because I'm still a well-paid programmer with a career. The pause turned awkward until the bartender broke the silence. Is uh, this guy giving you a hard time? She asked. I met her gaze and must have held it a moment too long. She cocked an eyebrow. Um, yeah, I finally said. He's an asshole. She chuckled and shot Lucas a playful grin. Please try not to scare away my customers, Mr. Mad Cow, she said. A thousand pardons, Miss Roxy, Lucas said and leaned into the bar. Say, could I convince you to whip up my usual and, uh, gin and tonic for my colleague here? <sighs> Good memory, at least. Sure thing. What sort of work did the two of you do together? She asked. We are quality assurance. Lucas winked at me. We're probably the best paid beta testers in the world. This world, at least, I said. But that only earned me a slightly confused look from Roxy as she got to work mixing our drinks. Isn't she something? Lucas said when she stepped out of earshot. I've been given to my own personal Turing test all evening. Oh, I'll bet you have. I shook my head. You know, there's an easier way to tell if she's real. I waved my holographic display back on and pointed to the purple diamond that appeared over all the simulated characters' heads in the overlay. A new translucent box rolled out beside Roxy, with her name and background information. I waved it away. Well, there's no fun in that, Lucas said. And I'm being serious. This sort of thing, this level of AI, this is the type of stuff I used to dream of working on back when I was at Dark Room. Oh, she's really perfect. Everything here is, in case you haven't noticed. And do you know what the worst part is? What's that? I mumbled, staring as Roxy twirled ice cubes around a highball glass. The worst part is they didn't need me to code it. I always thought it would be you and I that built a place like this, he sighed. At least we're still part of it, I suppose. Roxy presented our drinks, garnished with lemon and sprigs of rosemary. Lucas took his with an appreciative nod and sipped. Even the goddamn alcohol's perfect, he said. Anyway, how's the testing coming along on your end? My reply was cut short by a crash of shattering glass. Then screaming. It was guttural, so intense and unexpected that my concentration was immediately broken. 
I felt a surge of panic, like ice water down my spine. I spun around and saw the lounge table flipped on its side, the man convulsing on the floor. A woman rushed to his side, but he grabbed her arms, hurling her backwards. Stay the fuck away from me! He yelled as she staggered back. I set my drink down too hard, sloshing gin onto the bar. With my hand free, I flicked my overlay back on, confirming that the people were also human testers. Lucas was already on his feet, rushing over to help. I followed after. I can't breathe, the man screamed. I can't fucking breathe. Oh, God, wake me up. Wake me up. None of this is real. None of this is real. God, it's freezing. I'm drowning. I'm drowning in the fucking pod. Let me out. What happened? Lucas asked the woman. She looked frightened. He was fine a minute ago, she sniffled. Suddenly he thinks he's dying in real life. That I'm not actually real because I'm not feeling it too, I guess. Sounds like ASS, Lucas said, staring down at the man. Ass? I blurted out stupidly. No, idiot. Did you even read the forms they had assigned? Acute solipsism syndrome. It's a potential risk of total immersion. Lucas knelt down beside the man who was now shivering with his head propped uncomfortably against the leg of a lounge chair. Hey, buddy, Lucas said. You're gonna be all right. You're not drowning. You'll breathe in just fine in real life. They told us to watch out for these symptoms, remember? Nothing serious. You need to get up so you can report it. The techs would be helping him if there was really a problem, I said to the other tester. It came out more like a question than a statement. She gulped and nodded. I saw a familiar face over her shoulder. Mara. Mara was sitting back at the bar. Her long, dark hair framed a strange expression, something like pity, as she watched the commotion. I thought for sure she'd step in to help. The simulation was her project, after all. But instead, she took what appeared to be a martini from Roxy and drank it in a single gulp. After that, she said something to Roxy I couldn't hear, stood up, and left. You're really here, Lucas assured our colleague, still playing the role of paramedic. Try remembering how you got here. I looked back at Mara's empty seat. Roxy was wiping down the counter. I felt a pit of unease settling in my stomach. Remember how you got here, I thought. The elevator ride was so long that I nodded off. I woke up startled, like I'd been falling, and shrank with embarrassment. If the other people packed into the freight car had noticed, they spared me any acknowledgement. The only one looking at me was my own bloodshot reflection in the elevator's chromed paneling. Jesus. I look like shit. Fucking jet lag. But how long had we been descending? I barely finished unpacking when the Foundation staff knocked on my door. They ushered me downstairs with the other prospective testers into the basement of the Mountain Lodge. From there, we boarded the elevator. It was minutes ago, but it already felt like yesterday. I giggled stupidly, remembering the excruciatingly long load times in most of Dark Room's games. It became something of an inside joke to tramp our players inside elevators as a new level was loading. It was a necessary evil. To maintain immersion. Some of our more masochistic fans even found it endearing. So, is this where you've hidden the loading screen? I said to break the ice. No response. Either these weren't gamers, or they too were jet lagged past the point of zombification. Or maybe I'm just not funny. No, that is much further down, the woman finally said from beside the controls. She faced me and smiled knowingly. Well, at least she looked to be well-rested. Flowing black hair draped down her lab coat to the edge of her name tag. Dr. Mara Drost. It's getting really cold, the man said. I realized I could see my breath and wrap my arms together. It has to be cold for the computers to function, Mara said. That's why all the servers are kept so far underground. It saves the foundation a fortune in maintenance and cooling costs. The elevator chimed. When the doors opened, whatever was left of my grogginess vanished in a wave of awe. Lucas, what the hell have you gotten me into? 
We stepped out into what at first felt like an infinite black void punctuated with sharp points of white light. As my eyes adjusted, I could make out wires suspending the lamps from catwalks further above us. As bright and numerous as the lights were, they could barely scrape the volume of the massive underground cavern. Only the faintest impression of light reached the walls, just enough that I could discern the whirl of marbled stone in the distance. Up above the crisscross of man-made catwalks, the vaulted ceiling peaked in utter darkness. Welcome to the bunker, Mara said. She beckoned us down a path of lamp posts further into the cavern. It looked as though someone had teleported the guts of some research facility deep into the mountain. Cold steel and concrete refused to the natural stone with practicality that couldn't conceal the strange beauty of the caves. We passed through an imposing bulkhead door and across a bridge that spanned a lake of water, gleaming like black glass. The Foundation really built this place? said a woman, awestruck. It must have cost a fortune. Not exactly, Mara said without breaking stride. Actually, people have been building this place for thousands of years. Ancient people explored these grottoes and discovered their salt deposits. They mined it for centuries all throughout the Dark Ages, until it was sealed. Why was it sealed? I asked. The records are unclear about that. What we do know is that the Soviet government excavated it to use as a fallout shelter in the event of nuclear war. We have them to thank for most of the infrastructure, including the geothermal extractors. After the Cold War, it was sealed again, until we purchased it. So, to finish answering the first question, yes, it did cost a fortune. I followed along with the tour, wondering just who was investing so much capital into the Foundation for the sake of virtual reality technology. Sure, we'd have loved to get our hands on at a darkroom, but even at the height of our success, we were in no position to buy a fucking underground Russian base. Something didn't add up. Still, the pay was on a scale barely fathomable to someone who teaches game design to college students, and there was something else almost nostalgic. It felt like whatever this was, it was a chance to get in on the ground floor of the next new thing. If this proved to be groundbreaking, maybe I could make a name for myself in the industry again. We came at last to a second massive vault, clearly reshaped by some heavy machinery into a smooth, perfectly rectangular warehouse. Fluorescent light shone through graded catwalks that ran above dozens of stainless steel cylinders each of them barely larger than a person. The soft thrum of machinery reverberated throughout the room. Technicians scurried between computer terminals along the outer walls. Come, Mara beckoned our group up the stairs onto the catwalks. The first group has already been at it for a week. Have a look. Others will be joining you inside the simulation. From atop the walkway, we could see down into the cylinders. Many were empty. The rest held people floating upright in some kind of liquid. They wore breathing masks, not unlike scuba regulators, and appeared to be unconscious. The pods are total sensory deprivation, Mara continued. Closer, in fact, to suspended animation. In that state, your brain can interpret sensory stimuli from the simulation as a genuine substitute for, well, what you're experiencing now. Mara looked down at the occupied tanks. They are in a whole other world now. The town we've constructed for you to test is just the beginning. There really is no limit to the worlds we can build. When Mara looked up, she seemed to read the expressions on our faces. Everything is perfectly safe, she added quickly. We have a full medical team on site, 24-7. I've been immersed several times myself, and will be joining you all inside. Does anybody have any concerns? We're probably already inside, a woman mused. Everyone just slowly turned to her, and she explained. Uh, think of what we're on the threshold of here. If we can ever truly run simulations of reality, and there's only one true reality, then the odds are we're in some form of simulated reality right now. Someone objected, and the group seemed to explode immediately into a deep philosophical debate on the topic. The term Quantum Hall Effect was spat back and forth quite a bit. I, more or less, camped out at high school physics and tuned the discussion out. I just stared at the half-naked people below, 
floating in some kind of lucid dream. Fuck it, I thought. What have I got to lose? There was no hell until we built it. It's what Mara had said to Roxy during our colleague's panic attack. I'd asked Roxy out of curiosity after the situation had calmed down. Do you know what she meant by that? I inquired. No idea, Roxy said, and then asked if I wanted another drink. Oh, I am. Um, I really should get back to work. I declined. All right then. Good luck with the beta test. She winked at me. I left Roxy's alone to continue my nighttime exploration. There was no rules to this job, per se. We just had to spend our time in this place however we saw fit, and report any flaws in the experience. I decided that to give myself some structure I would pace out the boundaries of this town. It was modeled as a quaint little resort settlement in the mountains. The street outside Roxy's followed a bend around the edge of the town. Storefronts faced a low cobblestone wall on the other side of the road. Beyond that, the hill sloped down into a procedurally generated forest of pine trees that stretched out to a foggy horizon. It was clearly based on the real terrain above the bunker, but the town itself was a work of fiction. I strolled from streetlight to streetlight, dragging my fingers along the rough texture of the stone wall. A mild breeze rustled the silhouettes of trees and brushed gently over me. I closed my eyes and breathed the fresh, evergreen scent in deeply. Every minutia of sensation was as real as anything I've ever experienced. I daydreamed about the generation of games that would surely spawn from this technology. Even Darkroom's most immersive VR titles would seem primitive and obsolete going forward. Suddenly, sharply, the breeze became uncomfortably cold. Some primal sense told me to snap out of the daydream. Something was wrong. Mara's cryptic words came back to me. I realized I'd been walking into darkness. The streetlights were out. I turned around, confused to see I'd passed half a dozen blown-out lights without noticing it. The storefronts, too, were vacant and dark. I wondered if I'd stumbled into some unfinished area. The sound of the wind had changed, too. No, not the wind. The trees. Behind me, where the streetlights still worked, the trees stirred in the gentle breeze. But in the dark area, they stood perfectly still, as if frozen. I was already thinking of how to word this in the bug report when I realized I wasn't alone. Up ahead, leaning against a broken streetlight, was the shadow of a man. I walked towards him, hoping for some validation that he too was seeing the same thing, but I hesitated halfway between my streetlight and his. Something was wrong with him. He was twitching strangely, as if caught in the throes of some spasm. For a moment, I thought of the tester at Roxy's, convulsing in pain. But no, this was different. This man was sobbing. A cold got in, he wept in a raspy voice, seemingly to himself. I was about to ask if he needed help when the clouds parted, bathing us both in moonlight. My blood ran cold. The old man was withered and emaciated, little more than a skeleton. He wore nothing but the same neoprene shorts and nylon harness we were given in real life before entering the pods. The vertebrae of his spine jutted sickeningly against the pale, glistening flesh of his back. In disbelief, I waved from my holographic overlay. Nothing happened. I needed to know if this was real. If he was real. I waved again. And then again. It wasn't working. It's impossible, I thought, and kept trying. My frantic gestures must have gotten the old man's attention because he finally raised his head. Long strands of white, wispy hair parted to reveal the same breathing apparatus we all wore. Where his oxygen tube would be was only a torn, tattered rubber scrap. His bloodshot eyes opened wide with shock. 
They fixed on me with the same surprise and horror that I must have been reflecting back at him. I could hear his tortured breathing intensify. You shouldn't be here, he finally snarled. He lunged towards me. Stupefied, I was too late to react. His wet, freezing hands found my neck in a choking grasp. You need to wake up, he growled and tightened his grip. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't scream. Only panic. I tried to pry his hands off my throat, but they were too slick with the same goopy liquid from the pods. My hands slipped down his wiry arms, and that's when I noticed it. That stupid fucking tattoo. Death Squirrel. A squirrel holding a katana in shitty black ink. Matt Cow had gotten me so drunk at the launch party for our first game that he was able to convince me to get the damned thing. It was my own alter ego on my forearm to match his. And there it was. Blurry and faded, but unmistakable. On this skin and bones man. He had my tattoo. I stared at his face even as I struggled to breathe. The recognition washed over me in a wave of cold terror that swept my sanity away. It was me. He was me. The absurdity of my situation gave me a sudden burst of strength, dream-like vigor, and I hurled the ancient doppelganger off. It staggered and I gasped for air. Just when I thought it would charge at me again, something flashed in the distance. Suddenly, just for a moment, the sky was brighter than daytime. The abrupt brilliance stunned the creature and it stared horrified at the source beyond the horizon. No! It whimpered at the lingering glow of the explosion. I seized the moment and ran. As I did, a sound like the crack of thunder smashed through everything. More explosions burst across the horizon like lightning. Every illuminating flash revealed the town as something else. Shattered ruins, desolate and decayed. They never finished yet! The creature screamed. They'll never finish yet! Its cries became an incoherent wail of rage and agony, and then disappeared entirely in the roaring boom. When at last I made it back to the well-lit area, the entire cacophony ceased. There was only the gentle sound of the breeze and a slight tinnitus in my ear. My overlay finally responded. I kept running as I searched Mara's location on the user list. I found her on the rooftop deck of the tallest building in town. She was sitting on the ledge smoking a cigarette and sipping wine from a crystal stem. She greeted me without taking her eyes off the panorama of the town laid out before her. That I was a frantic, gibbering wreck gasping to catch my breath didn't seem to faze her. I tried to explain what had just happened. She only faced me to refill her glass from a bottle resting beside her. Her wind-tousled hair framed that same pitying expression she wore at the bar. What the fuck was that thing? I demanded. She shrugged dismissively and turned away again. She seemed to be staring at the shadowy part of town I just fled from. An anomaly, she said. Her lack of concern was exasperating. Hadn't she been listening? Didn't she care? I want out, I said firmly. Wake me up, now. She took a drag off her cigarette then flicked ashes off the side of the roof. I'm afraid that isn't possible, she said. Dr. Drost... I said slowly. Mara, I'm sleeping in one of your pods. I know you can revive me. She seemed to find this amusing, but there was something else cracking in her persona, as if she were trying to cope with something herself. Was she drunk? I already did revive you, she finally said, a long time ago. What are you talking about? I said incredulously. <sighs> We're right here. We literally just started. This instance just started, she said, as if she were clarifying the situation. My confused expression must have told her otherwise. It's all so lifelike, isn't it? She continued, gesturing across the entire landscape. We had you testers to thank for that. 
It was an iterative process. Every time we reran the simulation, your experiences helped us tune it just a little bit more. We got a little closer to perfection. Every time. Well, that doesn't make any sense. I gritted my teeth. Mara was supposed to be the one professional we could all rely on. She was our lifeline. We trusted her. Now she was spouting nonsense. How can I be in the simulation right now talking to you if you've already woke me up? Because you're an instance too, she said. A copy of your original mind. She finished her cigarette and tossed it away. That's why you had to be in those pods as long as you were. A frozen scan, we called it. Why? I began to mutter, but I felt shortness of breath. I was beginning to feel dizzy, dissociated. This couldn't be right. It was the entire purpose of the Foundation, she said. It is one thing to build a perfect virtual reality. Our benefactors wanted us to prove it was possible to upload minds to it. They wanted to live forever. On the inside, she went on, but I couldn't follow her jargon. Something about discovering the neural correlates of consciousness. No, I cut her off in a snarl. My head was swimming now. I, I mean, if this is all true, why are you telling me this? It's not like it matters anymore, she shrugged. Every time the simulation iterates, it deletes the previous instances and begins again with fresh copies. Every time? My thoughts flash back to those long nights at dark room, sitting at my desk, pacing the hallways, crashing on the couch in the break room, all the while strung out over the latest build of our game. The polished final product was the result of countless iteration, meetings at the whiteboard, debugging and redesign. Again, and again, version after version. That was just to make a video game. But something as complex as this place? How many versions had it taken to get this far? Dozens? Hundreds? So, you've murdered us, I said, confronting her gaze. Over and over again. I suppose that's one way of looking at it, Mara said. I wanted to scream, what other way is there? But I knew it was futile. There was nothing for me to do here with all my anger and confusion. I decided to leave Mara alone and do the one thing I could, which was to march back to Roxy's and get mind-numbingly drunk as soon as possible. I was about to head downstairs when I remembered something and turned back to her. Why did you say what you did back at Roxy's? What? It was her turn to look confused. You said there was no hell until we built it. If this place is so perfect, why did you say that? She shook her head and looked again to the dark, static part of town. The anomalies, she said. You're not the first to see one. But I... I don't remember them. Not from previous iterations, I should be able to remember. She hung her head down and closed her eyes. I wasn't lying at the bunker when I told you I'd been immersed before. I'm as much a copy as you are. The only difference is I can scan in regularly. I should remember every previous version unless... Unless... I'm not around to scan in anymore. She took in a deep breath and shuddered. And a glitch on that scale doesn't just happen randomly or overnight. It's a sign the hardware is failing. Has been failing for some time. But our servers were custom built for billionaires that want to live forever. They're kept deep underground in perfect conditions. They could run for a thousand years. Maybe longer. If nobody were left to turn them off, I said, connecting the dots. She turned to me with fresh tears streaking her face. I thought of the bunker, the frigid void of empty caverns deep beneath the mountains. I thought of terminals flashing attended only by withered skeletons. Geothermal extractors whirred beyond ancient and ominous Soviet bulkheads. 
sealed now and forever against some outside apocalypse. And somewhere deeper still, within some still running computer, my own long dead ghost was still trying in vain to wake me up from a simulation stuck in an infinite loop. Out past Mara's gaze, the dark patch of town seemed to grow larger, the ink-black tendrils of its desolation spreading from one streetlight to the next. The wind became chill, and with it came a distant sound, faint but familiar, like the wails of something lost and afraid. I waved open my holographic display and began a bug report. A. S. S. You've been listening to Beta Test by author Stephen Miller, as performed by yours truly. Now, if that story teaches us anything, it's that we really ought to be careful about what we wish for. In a world where totally immersive virtual worlds indistinguishable from our own are getting closer to becoming a reality, it's only a matter of time before the billionaires of Earth decide their fragile meat suits need upgrades and endeavor to live in the cloud. I, for one, think I'd rather be trapped in Crook's Landing with the thieves and murderers. <laughs> I'd like to personally thank you for joining me for this episode of Horror Hill. Don't forget to tune in again next week, when I yet again regale you with a handful of tales to terrify, plumb from the most depraved depths of the human imagination. Tonight's episode featured tales from the very talented G.V. Anderson and Stephen Miller. Crook's Landing by Scaffold was brought to you courtesy of G.V. Anderson. Miss Anderson is a world and British fantasy award-winning writer of speculative fiction from the UK. Her short fiction has been published in such places as Strange Horizons, Fantasy and Science Fiction, Lightspeed, and Nightmare. It has also been selected for Best of British Science Fiction and the year's Best Dark Fantasy and Horror. She lives and works in Dorset in the United Kingdom. For more information, visit her official website, gvanderson.com. That's gvanderson, spelled G-V-A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N, dot com or follow her on Facebook and Twitter to get her latest updates. Beta Test was presented courtesy of Stephen Miller. Stephen is a lifetime consumer of horror fiction with a passion for writing. He holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in fiction writing from Columbia College, Chicago. He's also worked with student game developers from Tribeca Flashpoint Academy as a writer and designer and has won the Gama Sutra Game Design Challenge nearly a dozen times. If you enjoyed what you've heard on tonight's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page, or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts, and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference, and would mean a lot to me. If you'd like to hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes, Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program, all of our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free, and available to download or stream. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases, and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. Thanks again for your support. 
Until next week, listener, when we meet up once again atop the horror hill for yet another dance with darkness. I bid you good night. Sleep tight, listener. And whatever you do, if you hear scratching at your door, don't open it. The darkness may have found you, but it's up to you <laughs> to let it in. <laughs> Thanks for listening. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Jason Hill. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Felipe Ojeda, Luke Hodgkinson, and Jesse Cornett. Final mixing and mastering by executive producer and director Craig Groshak. The program's artwork by yours truly, Jason Hill. Logo by Craig Groshak. Got a terrifying tale of your own that you like performed? I take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your work considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's submissions at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on social media to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and our other programs. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for Chilling Tales for Dark Nights as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every week. And don't forget to hit the thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you're after, listener, your search is over. Yet, let it be known, you haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. <laughs> <laughs>